Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Med School Minutes podcast, where we discuss what it takes to attend and successfully complete a medical program. This show is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. Here is your host, Kashik Gua. Welcome to another episode of Med School Minutes, where we talk about everything MD related with a focus on international students, uh, specifically students from the Caribbean. Today, we have a very interesting guest. We're talking to Dr. Ivan Escudero. Um, Dr. Escudero finished his residency in the United States and then chose to start his own clinic in Canada. So he has a very unique perspective of working in both a privatized uh, health system in the United States as well as working in a nationalized health system in Canada. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Escudero. Thank you so much for making the time, Dr. Escudero. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, we were briefly talking about how busy our alumni get, and I know how busy you guys are. Um, and I, we always appreciate any time that you um, give us. But without further ado, I would really like you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, you know, anything for St. James, such a great school, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, so about me, um, you know, I'm an alumni from St. James. I went to Anguilla uh, in 2014. Uh, loved every minute, minute of it. It was great. Loved the atmosphere, the beaches, the school. It was, it was a dream come true, really studying in paradise and then having the opportunity to do clinical rotations in the United States. That was great. I, I loved it. Um, spent four years with St. St. James. And then I ended up uh, matching into residency and family medicine residency uh, in beautiful Detroit, Michigan. Uh, very robust. It was, it was amazing. It was my number one choice. Um, I was so blessed to have learned from some amazing, amazing attendings. Um, so unique. I count my lucky stars every day that I met those people, made some lifelong friends, did some research as well. Um, I'm also Canadian <laughs> if I didn't, uh, mention that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And did some research, published a few uh, papers, co-authored them, some research abstracts. Uh, I, I worked in the United States briefly in a rural setting. And then now I have my own clinic in, in Canada. Um, I'm working there. I do some hospitals work, some some ER work from time to time, uh, and and it's great. It's it's awesome, and everything came full circle, and, and here I am. Awesome. So uh, you mentioned that obviously you're Canadian. You're back in Canada now. Did you find the residency match process particularly hard for Canadian students? Because we get that a lot from our students. Oh, Canadians are just so much harder. Is it or is it not? Or can you? Uh, account for it or, or or prepare for it so that it isn't particularly hard um in canada yeah it's it is a little bit more difficult i mean there's okay. not a lot of residency programs uh there there's you can count them on your fingertips in okay canada. um there's a lot more in the united states and you know there's a lot more opportunity as well um it it's i mean you can also say that it's a little bit more Competitive in Canada because there's so few residencies, um, but you know it, it's not impossible. Um, but in order to stand out, you know, having a great you know, application experience and so forth, it, it'll make the process a little bit more smooth and a little bit easier, especially you know with interviews and so forth. But Canada is a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. But what about as a Canadian applying to the U.S.? Is that harder? Is that you know, I know it's it's got to be harder because the U.S. Uh, programs are going to make a visa for you. Um, I mean, at least for me, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I I looked for programs that offered the visa, the, the J one visa, um, and I, I got a lot of interviews. I mean, they there was no issue with me being Canadian, and even for some of my friends who weren't Canadian or you know American, um, they didn't have issues as well. Um, if a residency really wants you, they'll they'll invite you out. They'll figure a way out to to sponsor you. One of my one of my friends actually uh, got an interview at a hospital where they don't offer any visas, and they made some exception. Oh wow! Him in. Yeah. So 
Uh, <laughs> coming from Canada, not once was it ever questioned at all. It was very straightforward. I guess they're used to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it's funny that you say that. Actually, uh, uh, two years ago, we actually had a student, a Canadian student, who had exactly the same experience. And this was a big hospital system, <laughs> like UNC. It was a University of North Carolina hospital wow. system. And they've never accepted an international student before. And they liked her so much, they went ahead and did it. In fact, the program director and the CMO directly called her up and said, hey, what do we need to do to make sure that you come to us? Yeah. And I was yeah. like, wow. Yeah. That, so it sounds like you have a very similar experience or, or like have experienced the same thing. The pr programs are more fixated on the candidate than they are about qualifications. Exactly. I mean... Even in, in your interview process, they, they'll ask you some questions that are out of left field just to see, you know, who you are as a person, right? Um, but, you know, everyone, doesn't matter where you're from, you know, even St. James, like you're qualified and you have the credentials to do residency and succeed. Awesome. Um, so you said after you finished your residency, you went into a, a rural setting uh, why was that? Because you studied in Det or you did your residency in Detroit, which is obviously a big metro area. Why did you choose to go to a rural setting? Right. Um, well, I mean, I like rural medicine. Um, okay. It's something that always, you know, interested me, you know, serving people in the underserved area. Uh, and in a rural setting, a lot of patients, a lot of people have multi-system diseases. They're, you know, they don't really have a lot of resources um, available in major metro cities. And I'd be able to use my skills to, you know, help those people. Most of the time, I'd be acting as their specialist because there's no specialist available. There's no endocrinologist. So I'd essentially be acting as their endocrinologist or their cardiologist to a certain extent <laughs> um, and be that basically main point of contact for their care. And I was able to use also my, you know, procedural skills as well in a rural setting. Even now in Canada, when I work in um, some places up north, I, that those skills that I learned in my residency and when I worked in a rural area really helped me. And it's, it's great. It's it's something that resonates with me. My my folks live in an underserved area, and since they don't have any very little access to to care. You know, I wanted to contribute back. I, I want people similar to my to my parents to, you know, have that physician that's there, you know, and with those skills as well. That's awesome. So, uh, was it a big adjustment going from Detroit, Michigan, to a rural area? Um, from lifestyle, lifestyle as well as professionally, was it a big difference? Uh, sort of. I mean, I, I've, I've lived everywhere. I've, I've lived in the Caribbean. Yeah. I've lived in major metro cities. Right. I actually came from a very, very small town. Um, it was, it wasn't like a big culture shock, but, um, you know, settling in, uh, you know, it obviously takes some time, but it, it wasn't something like, yeah, um, totally out of, out of you know, out of context, it was, it was, it was good. It was okay. It was art. Yeah. Because one thing I have noticed and, you know, we have a big system in, uh, West Virginia that we work with, okay, uh, which is largely rural, <laughs> but I visited West Virginia several times. I visited Kentucky, rural Kentucky. Um, and I've been to several, like even in South Dakota and stuff like that. But at least in the United States, the term rural is not the same definition as what you would say a rural, even in countries like, say, Australia, or mm -hmm. um, I'm originally from India. Like in India, rural means no sanitation, no water, no electricity. Right. In America, rural means, oh, yeah, you have to drive 45 minutes to the closest Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So um, in your experience, it's Canada rural and America rural equitable or or not? Um, actually, yeah. To, uh, in terms of medical care, yeah, I, I mean Canada, it, it's a lot more pronounced. Um, there's many, many millions of Canadians without a uh, physician, a family physician. I think the latest report was 2.5 million Canadians without a family physician. Um, and. And a lot of the areas, there's a lot of small towns and there's not a lot of major metro cities in Canada and it's so spaced out. So 
it, it's it's pretty emphasized. I'd say it's you know a lot more um, pronounced in Canada than the United States, um, and you know similar um, similar issues. You know with uh, distant facilities, where to get certain types of procedures done. Um, certain testing done. I think it, it's kind of the same in the states and, and Canada, but it's way more pronounced in Canada, for my, to my personal opinion, at least. So, I, I mean, you are particularly unique because you obviously studied and worked in the U.S. system, but then you chose, and now you have your own practice in Canada. What was the process like? And and obviously you were originally from Canada and it seems like you wanted to get closer back to home, closer to your parents. Um, what were the, other than these, were there any other major driving forces? Are, are, are pay scales the same in USA and Canada? What was the driving force for you to actually move back to Canada? Because we honestly, we don't really see a lot of uh, our alumni, Canadian alumni, go back as soon as you did. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I was dead set on the United States, you mm -hmm. know, and the United States provided me with that opportunity to live the American dream. Um, right. It's something that I, I, I dreamt about ever since I was younger. You know, like fulfilling that that dream, getting the opportunity to. To work in the United States, you always hear about the opportunity and everything, and even with the pay, right? Um, there were some changes in, in circumstance that you know I can't really get into too much detail with uh, you know my former employer, mm -hmm. um, you know contractual um, right, of course uh, issues, and then um, you know coming being a Canadian citizen, that that's where my home is, that's that's where I'm from, mm -hmm. that's where I was raised, and. You know, I said, well, I'm going to be working in Canada. Um, I, I took the leap, went back to Canada and <laughs> went through the process of getting my licensure, my certification. And then I said, you know what? I I've always dreamt of having my own clinic one day, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in Canada. And now that I'm back in Canada, I took that opportunity and said, let me, let me go ahead with this. And, you know, I also maintain my, my license as well right. in the States, but, okay. um, yeah, it's kind of a unique feature. Um, got to train in the United States, had that opportunity, and you know, now I'm back in Canada, my home country. That's awesome. So uh, you said that you had to go through the paperwork. Was the paperwork process easy? Is there a lot of reciprocity with Canada, Canada and USA? Um, Canada has gone a lot better in terms of um, uh, having physicians uh, return back to Canada if they trained in the United States or if they trained abroad. It's a better process now. Um, it's it, it takes a long time, um, but the paperwork it, it's pretty straightforward. And depending on which province you plan on working in Canada, the colleges are very very friendly. They're very nice. They're, they can answer all your questions. I've I've called the the Ontario College several mm -hmm. times to figure out everything else that I need to, and they're so friendly. They said, "Yeah, just do this and this and okay. this and." very very straightforward <laughs> okay so it's not like a crazy complicated process like i've heard uh especially in uh, countries like say for example india nobody really knows what's happening there's no clear answer it, it well they they use the ecfmg to you know validate your credentials and your, and your residency so you know my my residency it, is amazing and they communicated that to the ecfmg and it was very straightforward i mean my my residency program they're they're excellent. Everyone there is on top of their game. Um, from from other places, I mean, I, I I really don't know. So maybe kind of delayed, you know, with if we translated and so forth. Um, so it, it it really really depends. Um, but for me, at least, it was pretty smooth. And anyone else who does the residency in the United States, it should be pretty straightforward. So you mentioned that uh, Canada is open to uh, foreign physicians uh, who are trained abroad not just the United States. And I know that Canada has a massive dearth of physicians in, in uh, uh, across the board and Canada can't really, uh, doesn't have the number of applicants that say America has with its 350 million population. Um, can you tell me a little bit more? Do you think, and I know that you don't have first-time experience of not being trained in the U.S., 
But if somebody were to train in somewhere like uh, the Caribbean or Europe, what is the process for them? Is that, do you know if it's any different or is it easier? Is it harder? Um, I, from what I know that Canada, you know, they consider uh, the training equivalent in certain countries, not all countries. Okay. If it's the UK, um, Australia, um, the United States, I think Singapore, and I think Hong Kong, I think, I believe, I'm not too okay. sure. And obviously, if you train in Canada, Right. Um, but uh, they consider it equivalent. I know that there's a few physicians from the UK who are from the Canada, and it's it's considered uh, equivalent with the training from other countries. Doesn't mean that they cannot come back to Canada. I think there's a separate route that they have to do, like a okay. priority assessment or something. I'm not okay. too familiar with that since you know I did I did Got naturally. Pathway, yeah, naturally. So um, now now comes the you know the most interesting question to me at least, and that is. USA is a commercialized, privatized healthcare system. With it, Canada is a nationalized healthcare system that kind of follows the pathway of the UK with the with their national health services, NHS, and whatnot. Really, you worked <laughs> in both, and not just work. You actually own a business <laughs> in Canada, a, a clinic in Canada. Can you tell us from your experience? What do you think, from personal experiences, what systems, what were the pros of an American system and what were the pros of the Canadian system? Let's start with pros and then we can get into cons. Right, right. I mean, um, like my clinic, technically, you know, I run it and so forth, but, you know, I have one of my um, partners manages everything. So it's technically under their umbrella. Um, but um, yeah, in the United States, I mean, Having your own clinic is essentially like a thing of the past um, because it's really dictated by insurance companies. Um, and the reimbursement as a solo practitioner is is extremely difficult now. That's why it's a lot of hospital systems that physicians work under or with a very big group of physicians. Um, a lot of docs are, are at the mercy of, you know, the insurance companies and so forth. And it's it can be very tired. It can be very cumbersome with the paperwork and administrative tasks as well. Um, you know, you can get burnt out pretty quickly, but it, it, it's it's good lifestyle as well, depending on where you work and, and the model that you work at. In Canada, a lot of the the physicians there, you know, um, it's it's through the government, and the government is the one that you know deals with the payment and so forth, and reimburses the physicians or organizations. Um, it is totally different. Um, and the pay scale as well varies. You could get paid very, very little or a lot. And, you know, it's, it's socialized as well and it's dictated by the government, but there's not that much, uh, red tape as opposed to the United States or, uh, yeah, in, in terms of like billing and, and so forth. Right. And, and so especially with diagnoses, I know that in, in my residency training, like my residency training, like. I, I have nothing but high regard for my training. And I learned about billing, and this was in the United States, and having certain diagnoses were very important. Like you want to say, hey, like, uh, for example, like acute on chronic uh, kidney disease, uh, secondary to uncontrolled diabetes, mellitus, DKA. In Canada, it's not really emphasized. You just put one diagnosis for that. So it can be a little bit different, um, but, you know, the the underserved population is is kind of the same in both settings. Um, hopefully that answers that question. No, I think it does. I think this was a real eye opener because you <laughs> said that the U.S. system has a lot more red tape. Usually, that is something that people do not associate with the privatized system. Right. For for more of like the insurance companies, <laughs> in irrespective, yeah. Like I, I for example, I had I prescribed insulin. It was. Simple insulin, NPH, for one mm -hmm. of my patients, and I needed to do a prior off. And that was okay. mind blow for me that <laughs> this patient needs that. And it's like, All right. well, what what's the purpose of this, you know? Whereas in Canada, that's not really... The, it, there are some things with insurance companies, but not as emphasized as it is in the United States. Okay. But this is really interesting because one of the biggest arguments that 
a lot of, you know, it, this is a political debate as a nationalized healthcare system versus privatized in the United States, at least. They keep talking about how uh, our, our, because of the privatization, there's price gouging, all, all these negative things that happen. But, and, but one of the big things that people actually mention about the benefits of privatized healthcare is that it is efficient and there's no red tape. But here, as a practitioner, you're saying it's actually the opposite because of all these uh, oligarchy players that are controlling the system, you end up doing more red tape, though it's not necessarily mandated by the government. Exactly. I mean, and the thing is, it's it's something a lot of people don't realize that, you know, insurance companies really dictate how physicians should practice, which is mm-hmm. that, that should never be the case that you know, I can prescribe you a medication that is perfect. What you learn in medical school, what you learn in residency and the insurance company says, no, we're not going to cover that at all. And then you have a patient who cannot afford anything else. And it's like, this is, I, I'm now my hands are tied essentially. Right. And with that privatization, many, many patients are able to, you know, see specialists or see other physicians or nurse practitioners or PA, and they have the freedom to do so. Right. Uh, whereas in Canada, um, you know, in order to see a specialist, you have to see your family physician first. And, you know, if I prescribe a medication, the government, I mean, some medications are covered, but it's not like they say, hey, this is rejected. You need to do a prior auth unless it's like private insurance. But um, yeah, it's kind of like those those little nuances. Those, wow. Yeah. And and. From from a time standpoint for a physician, by your estimate, how much mm-hmm. beyond hiring, like if you're a, a small clinic okay. that you own in the United States, beyond hiring a specialist who's going to code all of these things for you, how much time does do you think that this takes up for the physician in the United States? I think, you know, a, a, if it's an independent physician it would take forever. And that's okay. why, you know, having a clinic of your own is almost a thing of the past. That's why a lot of employers now would have billers, coders, so forth mm-hmm. to take care of all that and kind of alleviate a lot of that administrative burden on the physician. Um, you know, but you're essentially at the mercy of their policies and what they want. Um, but I mean, it, it, it varies. It varies depending if you work for, you know, certain, you know, FQHC, for example, another big hospital system it, it kind of varies okay so but th- does that mean that in canada you can go ahead and say you have two two doctors two physicians uh very good physicians they can start a clinic but it sounds like in the usa that can't be like two physicians just no cannot start a clinic yeah i mean um if you were to sign up with medicare or medicaid it takes weeks it takes months and even then, oh, wow. the reimbursement is very um, okay. So a lot of physicians, there's no financial incentive to do so. Okay. Um, that's pretty limited. Whereas the whereas Canada doesn't have that. It's everyone is covered regardless, um, and they depending on the on the the code that you use a billing code, you get reimbursed out of money. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., is there, there would there be a situation where a patient essentially gets a treatment because, say, for an emergency situation, the insurance doesn't really cover it, and then the patient can't really pay, but then at that point, the clinic or the hospital system or the physician ends up footing the bill. Is that a likely scenario in the United States? Sometimes it, it does happen. It does. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's, it happens more often than you think. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not something totally foreign, but yeah, yeah, it does happen. Okay. And there's sometimes, I mean, for example, this is a classic example of Medicare, um, uh, like a decubitus ulcer that it mm-hmm. hap- that occurs while the patient is admitted in a hospital. Medicare will not pay for that patient's visit. Wow. It will cost the hospital a lot of money. Wow. So are are these scenarios likely in Canada at all? Where like the 
uh, hospital system or the clinic or the, the physicians are out, out of pocket trying to care for a patient, essentially. Yeah, um, th- there are a lot of social issues in Canada. Well, I, you know, it's it, it it's it's not a one size fits all. It, it really it really depends. You know, I know that Canada is trying to improve on that and implementing a lot of social services, but sometimes there's not a lot of resources, especially in the rural areas. So it's kind of a shame. But yeah, sometimes hospitals have to eat the cost for a lot of things because it's not available. Right. Yeah. So tell me, uh, so one great thing, when whenever anytime this debate comes up about which healthcare system is better, Canada or um, uh, USA or privatized versus nationalized. And one of the examples that they keep saying is that, oh, there are no practitioners to really do processes that are not necessarily um, required. And now, by the Canadian health system standards, a required process may, it's not just plastic surgery or to make yourself look good, something that doesn't necessarily kill you. So, for example, um uh you know i know uh a, a particular person who's had uh, a very uh open hernia and apparently in 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 canada this would be considered to be an elective procedure because they can survive by having somebody come and change the dressing twice a day through a third party you know, nursing practice or what have you. But the quality of life was such a dramatic change when you have to change your dressing twice a day from a professional versus if the wound is completely healed and cured and whatnot and it's done through surgery. Um, So I was told that in Canada, a procedure like that would not even pass muster and would not, you would be on a wait list. And this could be years uh, before anything gets taken care of, whereas in the United States, as long as you had insurance, you just shopped around for a surgeon. Within about a week, week and a half, everything was taken care of. Is this a real scenario? I mean, I've I've heard this in political debates, talked about this a lot. I've, you know, and this particular incident was a real situation that I experienced or like a foreign year and dear one. Um, is this a likely scenario or from your experience or... Um. Honestly, it hasn't been too, too long since I've been practicing back in Canada for me to say, okay. yeah, like 100% without a doubt. But but I've seen instances that were kind of like that in terms of, you know, referral to specialists for a very important, okay. um, you know, need. And sometimes um, some specialists, depending who, can flat out reject a referral. Um, so, yeah, it, it's possible um but, you know, I I think the Canadian system is phenomenal. It's amazing. It uh, not only gave me an opportunity, but, you know, there, there may be some some flaws, yes. But I think Canada is striving to improve that every single day. And every single physician that works there, you know, does everything possible for their patient and is fully capable of helping them. Um, but, yeah, I think some of those, those scenarios... You know, with that, if it's surgical, that's more of like the surgery <laughs> realm to, to deal with. But yeah, sometimes in the, in the family medicine clinic, it's kind of like, all right, let's let's take this approach. Let's go down this avenue to find what we can do. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, that's very interesting. So there is some truth to this thing that because, you know, recently I visited the United Kingdom and I met a friend of mine and he was saying he and his wife haven't been They've been on a wait list to see a general practitioner for their annual checkups. They're healthy, young, relatively young, healthy people. And they said that they haven't been able to see a general practitioner in three years. Um, In the UK, this is. Um, And I was like, yeah, that's never going to happen in the US because US, it's the other way around where the general practitioners are literally, the systems are sending you messages, emails, text messages. like. (laughs) Right. Any which way you can to come in for your annual checkup, and I and I really appreciate that to be honest. Yeah. Um. And whereas my buddy in the UK was saying that that's not that <laughs> not how, and he lives in a more rural area. He doesn't live in London. Yeah. Um. He lives in a more rural, 
a village near Portsmouth. And he's like, it's been three years. There's just no physician. Physician comes. They have a clinic here. And that clinic has not had uh, uh, an actual permanent physician for a very, very long time. Yeah. I mean, um, my my office manager would uh, mm-hmm. uh, would tell me, hey, this uh, patient here has been looking for a family doc for five years. Wow. And I would have patients who would come in and say, thank God you are here. Do not <laughs> leave. I've been looking for three four years or my only family physician either passed away or retired and we have no doctor whatsoever okay and and yeah like many many patients are very grateful for that and you know that that that's why i got into medicine you know like like it's it's not about the money for me right It, it is not and you know one could argue that you get you get paid like very well in the United States, right? But for me, it's about delivering care to patients. I love my patients. I have this very good patient-physician relationship with every single one of my patients, and they matter a lot to me. And I take that time and effort. That's why I got into family medicine, because because these people need care. They need care. They do not have anything. Some of them don't even have voices. And for, like, figuratively speaking, and now I can act as an extension of their family to be a voice for them when they don't have a voice. And when I do uh, some locum up north, like it's my opportunity to give back to them, to help them out. That's why I got into medicine. And it, it, it's, it's something I cherish every single day. So when I hear patients say, please don't leave, like that resonates with me, you know, like, like, it, it means a lot. Like, thank God it's been five years. Yep. Don't worry. You're in good hands. I'm going to take good care of you. That's awesome. Um, you mentioned that uh, physicians in, in uh, U.S. don't make as much money as physicians in Canada. No, no, no. That, I, that, sorry. I meant to say in the U.S. they, they would make they would make a lot. <laughs> like oh, okay. A lot okay, more, okay, okay. Like, right, like right. a significant much more but you know in in canada it it depends on the model in which physicians you know work uh for for me because i'm a solo practitioner and so forth and coming back you know i'm focused more on delivering high quality care right. and whatnot and I, i'm not after the money whatnot. right of course this is this is my passion right and i love teaching as well right so you know teaching medical students and then having them with me and and all that that means that means a lot more to me <laughs> awesome yeah so um uh one thing is so I, I mentioned right in the beginning of the podcast we haven't had that many students from canada who finished their residencies in the united states like yourself very few of them have gone back and every time i've spoken to them they've always mentioned that the salaries just in canada don't equate to salaries in the US. So the very fact that you went back clearly shows your passion for the subject. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it, it fits my personality so well. Yeah. And the States, like, I mean, with the privatization, you can make a lot, a lot of money. And as a family physician, you can make more than some specialists. Yes. uh, In Canada, no, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> but kudos to you for me. You know, I mean, literally doing what doctors were meant to do. Yeah. Helping people. That Absolutely. is really amazing. Absolutely. And uh, I know you mentioned that you um, like training, teaching students. Uh, I know we've, I know you are going back to St. Vincent uh, uh, later this year in a couple of months couple of weeks actually yeah um and we're hoping that you get to interact with some of the students and inspire them with this amazing story but uh why don't you tell us a little bit about your time in saint vincent oh you're from anguilla you weren't actually in saint vincent but you you're what it means like going back to saint james and uh to to see the development of saint james um in in, in a different island. I know it's we're a 25 year old school and you're a part of our rich history. So yeah, I, I mean, I mean, going in Anguilla was was wonderful. 
it was incredible. I miss it every single day. Um, just being in shorts and flip flops, going to the lectures and just that one on one with the professors. I, I wouldn't change it for the world. If I could do it all over again, I definitely would do it. St. Vincent, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing students and, you know, hopefully you know, encourage them to really follow their, their dream, you know, and uh, perhaps maybe they get into family medicine as well and, you know, practice. And, you know, and we need practitioners like you who truly, you know, are passionate about the subject to talk to these students because one thing that I've noticed uh, with a lot of the newer classes that we've seen, mm -hmm. a lot of the older classes, they genuinely get in because they're passionate about the subject. <laughs> because I'm going to be very honest, there's no other profession in this planet where you have to work or study as hard, not mm -hmm. work, study as hard as you have to do in medicine. Absolutely. Um, and the amount of time commitment and effort that goes into becoming a physician, at least in the United States. It's unparalleled. There's no other country in the world uh, or no other profession in the world where you have to put that kind of time commitment mm -hmm. in order to do this. Is it? However, what, we've beginning, what we're beginning to see is that, and I think that this is kind of an offshoot. I mean, we're going on a little bit of a tangent okay, here, but I have to, okay. <laughs> I have to uh, rant a little bit. Okay. And I think social media has a huge role to play because people started talking about their salaries and income. Mm -hmm. And when you take a physician who's been practicing for 10 years, the income that they're going to make, it's unparalleled that in almost any other profession, they're not making that kind of money. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue is that no, the social media conveniently cuts out the fact that this person probably spent anywhere between 10 to 16 years uh, just being able to lay the groundwork to have to start from ground zero. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then they work for 10 years. So those are some of the things that are omitted. So what we're beginning to see is a lot of students coming in that are entirely focused on the paycheck. Yep. And yep. having a personality like you who is truly in it for the passion. I mean, we have a ton of um, alumni who are very similar to you, but you being able to address the students would make a world of difference to them. Yeah. That, you know, because you had all these choices, but despite that, you chose to literally give back to community. Mm -hmm. It's, and, uh, yeah, it, it's honestly, it, it sounds cliche, but, you know, I, 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 I love being part of the community. That's how I was raised, you know, very family oriented, very, very tight knit. And I grew up in a small community and, you know, that that's my personality. And, you know, telling any student chasing after the money you'll never be happy because it can go like that in a heartbeat and I, i've seen people where, where it happened you know and and even in my residency training right like the my associate program director my program director they were so inspirational they were incredible the faculty and their dedication to the underserved area was unparalleled it was amazing so I was able to see that firsthand and I'm like, you know what? Thank God I'm in, I'm in this program. Thank God that I got to see this firsthand, right? Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you'll be getting a good salary in the United States for sure. But if you chase after money, you, you won't be happy. You won't be happy. And it, it'll just be a rabbit hole that you're going to go into. And, you know, once that's all gone, you should have something that'll make you feel fulfilled that's why i love teaching that's why i love giving back to the community because that that gives me it's it's like my vice it really is right right so well i trust me if i had vices that are that good i mean I, my wife would be very proud of me <laughs> <laughs> i can tell well, you that much. <laughs> yeah but, but it, it's funny you mentioned like social media does have an influence like oh a day in the life like a dermatologist mm -hmm. like that like that's cool that's awesome yeah for me, with family medicine, I don't know what I'd see next, and that's why I like variety as well. And um, yeah, no matter where where you work in the states, like employers will give you a very good contract. Right. So it, it, it varies, but um, you know, the whole point of studying medicine is to help people. Yeah. No, yeah. I would even argue that somebody who is not 
passionate about the subject, which is what we're seeing more and more of. People would be like, oh, I saw this TV show and this looked great and I want to join it. Mm -hmm. But what you see in a TV show is, number one, an embellishment. Any Every TV show is <laughs> yeah, an embellishment. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. um, but number two is that what you're seeing on the TV show is probably of, after 10 to 16 years of work that an individual physician would have to put into even be yes. recording at that level. Yes, you know, absolutely. And these are things that, that like Grey's Anatomy doesn't talk about this, that, oh, hey, yeah, by the way, this person went through three board exams and how many state board licensing tests and how many failures mm -hmm. and how many broken relationships yes. and <laughs> how many all-nighters that they pulled. Nobody talks about all that. And right? right, exactly. And that's when you have these youngsters come in because even med school is not easy, um, especially in a program like uh, St. James. It's an accelerated program. It's tougher. It's harder. Um, these are all things that students completely tend to ignore. And then when the going gets tough, you know, the people who aren't cut out for it are just dropping off like flies at that point. They were like, whoa, this is not what I signed up for. This is not nothing like what I saw on TV or this is not nothing like what I saw on TikTok. Exactly. And, and like residency too, like, you know, residency is hard. It is extremely hard. Um, so I think you know, expecting everything to be, you know, on a silver platter. No, that's, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are countless nights where I didn't get sleep and whatnot, but you know, I was hungry for it. I was passionate right. about it. Right. And, and I wanted that me and my friends, my colleagues. Right. Um, but you know, I, I was able to de-stress as well, but there's a lot that you have to go through to, in order to reach that level. Right. 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 Well, I mean, uh, Dr. Escudero, thank you so much for your time. But before yeah. we leave, I do have one final question for you. Sure. So for students who are already in our program, say hypothetically, when you go in a couple of weeks, you're going to meet a couple of them. And usually when I ask, hey, what do you want to be? It's usually always something ultra sexy. Like the most common answer is cardiothoracic surgeon. <laughs> because I don't know, maybe it just rolls off the tongue better. I Who knows what it is, but... Incoming class, MD1, we always ask, okay, what, what would you want to be? And the hands go up and it's always cardiothoracic surgery. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, these are obviously students who are thinking about the end result and not all the work that has to go in. <laughs> what advice would you have for the students coming in to an MD1 program now? <laughs> I'd say take it step by step. I mean... Every single physician, whether it's a cardiothoracic surgeon to a pediatrician, have, has to learn this. Um, but don't go chasing after the final result. Take everything step by step, day by day. Absorb this information. Learn. Ask questions. Ask why. And then when you do your rotations, you'll be able to you know get a better glimpse of that. But Going in an MD1, take it day by day, one day at a time. You know, give it your all every single day. Um, and everything, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Every day, it's a new chapter. It's a new blessing, you know. So learn about, you know, histology. Learn about the biochemistry. And then eventually, time's going to pass by and you're going to start learning about the pharmacology. And you're going to start learning about the physical examination. Everything is going to come into place, Right. And then now you'll start saying, hmm, maybe I start want to do this. Maybe I want to do that. Take it every single day, one step at a time. And don't look at the end because you'll miss the enjoyment. And literally, you'll enjoy it too. Go to the beach. Go enjoy sometimes. Relax. Spend time with friends. But just take every single day, step by step, and get tons of sleep as much as you can. <laughs> Because once you start residency, you won't get sleep. <laughs> oh, wow. Does does that ever get any better? Because I heard for surgeons, they're like, yeah, we're lifelong residents. Yeah, so, yeah. For, I mean, honest, does that get better for like you guys eventually? Attending life is very, very good. Um, okay. You know, you can set your schedule to a certain extent. But um, yeah, family medicine, I'd say, mm -hmm. has a lot more work-life balance. And, 
you can awesome. you can do everything. But you know, for those incoming MD1 students, take it day by day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Doctor Escudero. You for we're me. we're so excited to have you on the island. And I know uh, we're actually creating some buzz around you and you your visits with some of our students. <laughs> so you will have one full day, if you want, that is to address the students and talk to them and meet them. Yeah. We're also organizing a health fair when you're going to be there. So you might have uh, exposure to the local population. I know you've done this in Anguilla when you were there. Yes. So now you're going to do this in St. Vincent. Um, and I think you're going to be meeting a lot of our board members and stuff like that. Absolutely. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, as always, we really appreciate it. And I know you've helped us so much in the past with open houses and student referrals and things like that. We really appreciate it a lot. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And, you know, St. James, you know, has always been there helping me achieve my, achieve my dream. So it's the least I can do. Thank you so much, Dr. Escudero. Uh, it really was eye-opening to learn about the differences in a privatized and a nationalized health system and how you operating in both those systems um, really worked for you. But uh, thank you so much for giving us those insights. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your passion and all that you are doing for the Canadian community at large. But um, again, if you... Uh, like the contents of this podcast, uh, please follow us on any of the platforms where you uh, prefer to get your podcasts from, be it uh, Spotify, Google, uh, Apple, you name it. Um, and uh, don't forget to like and follow and um, download as many episodes as you like. Uh, but one thing, always remember there is no shortcut to becoming an MD. Thank you so much for tuning into our show. We hope you enjoyed another episode of Med School Minutes. If you like our content, please follow us and receive notification when a new show is posted. This podcast is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. For a video version of this podcast, please check us out on sjsm.org video.